Hi everyone and welcome to Beyond Tomorrow from the New Zealand Herald in partnership with NYOB. I'm Will Trafford and for the past few weeks we've been tackling the unprecedented business environment affecting thousands of small and medium sized enterprises across New Zealand as the world battles to slow the spread of the novel coronavirus. As always, Ingrid Cronin Knight, NYOB's country manager is here. Ingrid, it's our last show. Well, I'm pretty um, sad about this. It's uh, It's been a great series. All 15 episodes, I think, have uh, delivered our business owners and leaders some practical tips about how they navigate their way out of this cash flow crisis that, that they find themselves in. Uh, but yeah, sad to see it go, but I think we've delivered some great content that our business owners can leverage and really excited about the panel today. Uh, you know, I guess as we come to the end of this lockdown, there's a huge amount of lessons learned and context uh, that, that we've got. And so it'd be great to give you the best of the best uh, and the most practical tips you can take away from today. The information we've had uh, from the many, many guests um, have been has been so incredibly valuable as well. I'm feeling well and truly out of my depth. However, let's intro some of the panelists and explain exactly why um, I probably shouldn't really be on the panel. Matt Rogers, accountant and chairman of NZCA. G'day, sir. G'day, Will. Thanks very much for having me. And uh, Ben Lothhagen, senior business banker from ANZ. Hello there. Hey, Will. How are you going? Nice to be here. Thank you very much. Craig Garner, also chief executive of Business Mentors New Zealand. G'day. G'day there, I'm very pleased to be here today. And last but not least, of course, Leanne Watson, the Chief Executive of the Canterbury Chamber of Commerce. Hello. Kia ora. We know that uh, coronavirus has been uh, had its pretty unprecedented negative effects on the economy. Um, someone start me off, though, with a bit of optimism, if you can, around um, you know a great story around a Kiwi business, um, perhaps the nature of tech uptake, or a business that's pivoted, maybe Leanne or Craig, and, and maybe not taken advantage of the environment, but at least, you know, sort of not, not, not closed down the shop and given up the ghost. From a mentoring perspective, we've obviously had a lot of people inquiring about help. And I think one of the key things for most small business people is that they're in isolation and they're looking for people to help them. So um, often when you're in, in that position, you're not th thinking straight, you're not, you're not being clear on what the opportunities are. And um, we've certainly had plenty of stories where people just sat down and, and after a relatively short time, they've been able to sort of clear the way and, and get on with some things that have made a big difference. And I think the key is it's often the little things that make a big difference, you know, getting an action plan in place, uh, working out your finances so you can make some good decisions. And um, and certainly um, the technology point that you raised, and, and I've seen a couple of cases recently where um, companies like zeal.com are offering free websites to SMEs, which is a, a pretty magnificent thing. They put 500 free websites out there. And um, I was talking to their chair the other day and he said that there was a cafe around the corner completely uh, ready to, to, to go into total hibernation. Um, they set them up with a commerce site immediately and now they're in a position that they've got quite a novel pick up, take out, send out coffee option that they, they just weren't able to do before. So by putting a little bit of technology in place, um, the same business model can carry on and, um, and, and they're able to survive. Ditto. Hey, Leanne, some of the great stories have come out of Canterbury. One of my favourites is you've got a pizza joint down there that's gone from doing pizza delivery to bases. Ingrid and I have talked about it before, um, you know, in, in light of the horrendousness that was the Canterbury quake, right? You guys became so much more agile. And I mm. guess in a way, this is a huge advantage down there too. Oh, look, absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the things that um, I often talk about is, having come through um, a significant amount of, of adversity in Christchurch and Canterbury, uh, what we're seeing across our business community is incredible resilience once again. Uh, and what comes with that is the ability to, to be really agile and pivot pretty quickly. Uh, so, you know, these businesses in, in our city and our region are incredibly um, quick to respond uh, and, and move through that initial sort of reactive phase to actually thinking about the long term. Now, of course, that said, there are absolutely businesses that are hurting, um, you know, right across our community and, and indeed right across the country. But I think, you know, picking up on some of the points that Craig talked about, you know, we have seen businesses who have really thought outside of the square. They've applied technology um, and they've pivoted really quickly. There's a number of uh, good things that have come out of this, if I can call it that. You know, one of which is we've seen all these businesses use technology that they've never used before. Um, you know, I mean, how many of us, uh, sitting on this call, um, you know, would have done a, a Zoom session like this three weeks ago. 
So, you know, and we're looking at uh, collaboration tools that have been used across business that, um, you know, we've probably leapfrogged into this uh, use of technology more than what we ever would have um, in the past. And Matt, you were nodding your head along there. Look, absolutely echo exactly the same thoughts as uh, as Craig and Leanne. Um, just fantastic. So many business owners who have not spent the last four weeks uh, sitting down and, and waiting for the world to reopen, but have used this as just a fantastic opportunity to really reassess what's important in their businesses, the way that things uh, will look and will work into the future. And, and that collaboration piece, um, just incredible working with a, a large construction company here in Hawke's Bay, uh, you know, still uh, pre-COVID going through uh, elements of still having the whole team coming in every day and sort of debriefing on what was happening on, on all the various job sites have now moved into a digital platform and cannot believe how fantastically that has worked and, and we'll be very much looking forward to the efficiency gains that will, will fall out of that. That doesn't diminish at all uh, the challenges that, that we're all dealing with day to day and all these business owners uh, are, are going through all the time and we'll talk about uh, a lot more of that. But um, yeah, definitely taking the, the smooth with, with the rough, there have been some, some, great, uh, some great wins and efficiency gains in there amongst, uh, amongst our business owners, so credit to them. You spoke about the challenges there, Matt, and, and I guess we should talk a little bit about that because not all businesses have been able to, right? If, you, if you're a sparky, if you're a builder, that kind of thing, it's, it's, it's been a little bit harder. I wonder if um, anyone has thoughts on sort of evolving your business for what we're calling the new normal. I suppose um, some, some pro tips on it, also even to know when to hold them or, or pivot your business or, or fold them. One of the, the key points, especially when uh, we deal predominantly with small business and, you know, it's a fairly big sector when you think 500,000 small businesses in New Zealand, um, we, we have um, a, a primary issue with most of them from our own experience, again, is that there's a lack of planning, um, there's a lack of financial literacy and awareness and a lack of digital literacy and awareness and picking up the point that Matt just made and I thought he made it very well um, actually is but businesses have learnt a lot in a very short time as a result of the need to engage um, and even using our own example um, we were well prepared for this and as most businesses should um, you know a year and a half ago we went through an exercise where we brought a new technology into our business all our servers and everything are in the cloud so when we need to go home we literally picked up our laptops went home and worked as usual there was no issues with file access there was no issues with um, working remotely our phone works over the internet so we can still work normally now interestingly after a very short time um, one um, you know the introverts in the office loved it of course and the extroverts had to be ex explained what was going on but um, at the end of this um, we discovered quite quickly that we were able not only to work effectively, but we were getting, we were far more productive. Um, so my, our normal working hours are eight to 4.30 um, because of the changed environment. I changed the staff hours to nine to four um, because we were getting more work done in a shorter amount of time and it gave them the freedom in the morning and the afternoon to do a few things. So we looked very quickly at the model of what we were doing and, and I think um, we've got to acknowledge that every single business is different, so none are the same. So all of us, and as part of our um, transition into level three, we have to plan. And that involves, planning involves engaging with your staff. You've got to talk to your staff about what, what it means to them. And even if they're still at home, and if they can be at home, they need to be, how do they feel about that? What does that mean to them? What, you know, what has changed? What's their fears? What's their... So by having that conversation, you, you, you're kind of understanding more about your own business and your own staff, but, but getting it on paper um, just alleviates a bit of the pressure because suddenly you start seeing things that maybe you have missed. So um, planning is number one. Obviously, knowing your finance is number two. And getting with this technology three, a, a, um, technology issue is all paramount. I feel like I'm in a bit of the um, Ingrid Cronin night boot camp with this one because she keeps hitting at home with me every time again. Know your numbers, know your numbers, know your numbers if you're going to the bank, know your numbers if you're going to the accountant, know your numbers. Keep, keep knowing the numbers. The other ones I like from you, Ingrid, was has your market vanished? Is it still there or is there another way that you can address it? Have you right-sized your business? Um, have you killed off any unproductive sort of categories? What else have you got, Ingrid? Those are the ones that I've wrecked my brain for. 
Oh, look, I think, um, yeah, number one is cash flow. And, uh, you know, as we exit this, uh, people will either have passed that date where they can't meet their means or, uh, yeah, some will be flourishing, but if they're not, then you'll have need to have that plan, all those scenarios around where you see uh, and model where you think your demand's going to be and, uh, and, and your revenue coming in. And you've got to get on the call and talk to your debtors and find out when they can pay because everyone's going to have to pay a bit and you want to get the, the cash flowing across the economy. Uh, but, but agreeing when, when they can pay and with your new customers, if you, if you want to change uh, your payment terms, you want to get on the front foot with that. So maybe you used to pay monthly, but now you've got to go to seven days or, or cash kind of kind of terms, but you need to have that conversation around the revenue to find out what's coming in. Uh, and then you'll have a view on what your burn rate is around your fixed costs. Uh, and so you'll know um, the point when you've got some concerns and that's probably when we head to our uh, banker, which we'll go to, um, yeah, I reckon to Ben to give us some tips around how do we finance our way through this working capital. Uh, and then uh, I think we'll come back and talk a bit about the safety and people because there are a couple of points I do want to add around that. Yeah, thanks, Ingrid. That's great. Um, I think, um, yeah, echoing your thoughts, I think the, the first thing you will do, as, as I say, is really plan uh, for, you know, the period ahead. And um, that might uh, that might be a shorter term and then a, and then a longer term plan. Um, and the first thing I would say is to, is to get in touch with, with your bank early and get an understanding of, of, of what the options are that are available to you. Um, we've got, you know, the banks have uh, a wide range of uh, sort of tools in their, their tool belt, I suppose. Um, but we do lose some of those tools a little bit um, when accounts potentially go overdrawn or arrears or, or, or things like that. So the earlier that you do um, get in touch with your bank and understand what those options are, um, the more that we're going to be able to help. We'll still absolutely be able to help those clients who perhaps do find themselves already in a bit of trouble, um, but we've got a lot faster and a lot uh, smoother means of looking, uh, helping those clients who um, are you know, still, still okay for now. Um, then presumably the government guarantee is, is a big advantage for, for banks as well, right? They, you, you must be in a slightly better position to help businesses that at one stage you might not have been quite as in, you know, well placed to do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think um, there's probably a couple of things on that front. I think there's probably not a, a one size fits all solution. So that is a great option that we do have um, for our clients uh, there. There are some key things around um, you know, how long those loans need to be repaid over and what sort, of, what sort of funding requirements that they need. And so I think probably more broadly, the right thing to do is, as I did, to get in touch with the bank, talk about um, what, what's the, what are the things that you are, are needing and whether that might be a 30, 60, 90 day type thing or whether there is some longer term requirements in that space. And then we can talk about all the options that are available to you um, and sort of go from there, I suppose. Yes. Hey, Ben, I've got a question for you. Like, yeah. Quite practically, we've got a lot of, sort of owner operators or sole traders and they, they will have taken, you know, they have mortgages at home. Yeah. You know, what would your advice be to, it's a, it's a broad category, but uh, to, if their business is in debt and you've got low interest mortgage rates, yep. do you think they should kind of take more against the house to finance this business kind of cash flow crisis or would you advise right. against that? Well, I, well, without being able to provide advice, um, what I probably would say is that, it's understanding the options are, are probably really, really important. And, and one of the things around um, lending against assets, uh, particularly property, for example, is the fact that it can be repaid over a, a longer term than what um, a loan under the Business Financing Guarantee Scheme or even a loan that's sort of secured by guarantees, general security agreements might be able to provide. Um, and so for a lot of clients, that might be more a more practical or uh, a better solution for those, um, for those individuals. The other thing you talked about um, as well was terms of trade. Um, and if you're thinking about changing the terms of trade or if you think about the terms of trade that your clients have now, also have a bit of a think about the existing facilities that you might have with, with your bank currently in terms of, in terms of lending. Um, for example, if, you know, if you've got monthly terms of trade with your client but you're paying your loan weekly, is that really the right thing to be, to be looking at? Um, and similarly, for those clients who have, you know, higher interest rate facilities like credit cards, for example, they may not be, whereas that previously they were paying those often full every month to avoid interest costs. Um, that may not be the case now for the next wee while. Thinking about the type of card, you know, is a rewards card still the right option versus one of our low rate um, solutions? That may be a bit more appropriate just to reduce some of those costs um, in the interim anyway. Hey, Matt, a question for you. Who, who do we negotiate with first? And, and Ingrid tells me all the time, you know, it's so important, talk to your advisors, talk to your advisors, talk to your advisors. How do you know if you've got a good accountant? 
Look, I, <clears throat> the world of accounting has um, has changed for the better drastically, um, and and that has largely been levered by the fantastic tools and products that we've uh, that, that we've got in the marketplace. Um, you know, it's ostensibly MYOB and uh, and a whole bunch of the like. Your accountant now should be moving from a very reactive based role, someone who you have touched base with a couple of times a year and has told you uh, how things have gone last year, how much tax you've got to pay a few of those conversations. Your accountant and your team of advisors now should be very much up to the play with where things are in uh, at real time uh, and supporting you in terms of uh, what proactively you can do in your business. Um, I am a big believer in having a, a, a solid team of, of advisors uh, around a business owner, uh, being very, very clear that plan that Craig talked about uh, so well is, is seriously lacking in so many businesses, understanding that plan, having that team of advisors all uh, around that plan and all of them helping you towards something proactively. So to me, that is, the, that, that is what all small business owners out there should be looking for is an accountant who is up to the play, understands what's happening in your business right now and is in a position to help you going into the future. If you could have uh, you know, a, a meeting with your advisor uh, weekly, probably as a cadence right now over Zoom for 15 minutes just to check in with where it's at, I think that those skills, the fact that uh, you know, accountants across the country have it is gonna make a massive difference for our small business community. Look, I think that's another area that we can really sharpen things up rather than your meeting having to be a, a 45 minute or, or an hour long thing, just a, a, a quick dip in for, for 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, uh, where am I at? What am I doing? You know, so easy to get two or three people on a call like this without, you know, all of the time commitment that traditionally used to go with that, with everyone having to drive to one location and all get around a boardroom together. Um, look, I couldn't agree more. Um, and just imagine the savings we'll all have on our fees as well, instead of having the hour long meetings that I'll be 15, which will be fantastic. Um, but look, I think one of the points that I wanted to really reinforce is, uh, and you know, the Prime Minister right at the outset, um, you know, her, her words were, we're, we're all in this together. Um, and actually, that, that couldn't be more true. And now is a time for these businesses who, you know, for some of them, um, and I think Craig mentioned it at the outset, small businesses are often um, operating reasonably isolated. Um, although in saying that, 90% of, of uh, members across my um, organisation are small business, so they, they do um, generally um, engage with organisations like the Chambers and the EMAs around the country. But now is a time for them to actually reach out and seek that support. Um, and often that support um, is available at no cost um, or at a very low cost. And they can make sure that they are getting the right um, advisors. They're getting, you know, referred on to the right people um, for the right reasons at the right time. Don't leave it too long to actually ask for help because often, if you leave it too long, uh, that you know you end up in a pile of you know what, um, and it's very very hard to to undo after that. So yeah, I would absolutely endorse uh, reach out to those trusted advisors and have a good look around your community because there's loads of different sources of who those trusted advisors actually are. And Ingrid, they, they, the government's put 25 million but behind this as well, right? We, we, we did a previous episode where we talked about the potential of not necessarily creating a board in the traditional sense, but like an advisory board of people who understand those, those different sort of silos within your business. Yeah, the government, uh, on the first fact is the government has put $25 million into the regional business support network and you can reach out to them and they'll refer you uh, to, um, you know, an advisor that can support you, including um, off to the ANZ organisation to, uh, you know, in the Chamber of Commerce and, and then they'll have affiliates that, that are members that they can recommend you go towards. Um, I always actually think as a leader, it's always good to have your own personal board of directors uh, and that you can go and consult and have those conversations with. But if you think about, uh, we had uh, the session with, with Kirsten Patterson from IOD and she said that really people only get boards uh, or directors when they get up to the sort of 10 to $15 million mark. And we know that New Zealand businesses, there's a whole heap of them that exist, you know, probably half a million or more that actually have revenue less than that. And so if you can, uh, both using uh, digital technology, but, but get that trusted group of people that are in your court, uh, that'll make a big difference, and particularly as you navigate your way out of these some challenges, I think it's um, it's perfect timing. Cool, Leo. Yeah. Well, I, one of the things we might um, sort of circle back to slightly is is what again it's it's one of your hot topics, Ingrid, around renegotiating around contracts and stuff like that. For example, renewing your lease agreement and negotiating maybe an update for the ADLS, the Auckland District Law Society 2020 version, which was all kind of based around Christchurch, right? Which meant if you couldn't get into your premise, 
uh, you didn't have to be charged for it, right? There's a lot of debate in legal circles about um, how much validity that one has. But I wonder if Craig or Matt, you, you can talk me through a couple of tips on how you negotiate this, because we know there's a new normal coming, right? And we know that that means that, you know, a, a lot of creditors and that kind of thing would rather negotiate with a business that's still around um, and, you know, get 50% of something versus 100% of nothing. Yeah, look, from, uh, from from my point of view, communication is, is absolutely imperative with, with these sorts of things. I think uh, a, a small business owner, and I take my hat off to every single one of them out there, they wear so many hats, they have so many fires to put out uh, at all times, and, and I know how many sleepless nights and, and the anxiety and everything that goes with it. Um, one, th one thing that uh, I, I absolutely steadfastly believe in is uh, talking through those issues, actually picking up the phone, you know, creating a meeting, having those conversations with uh, with, with landlords, with creditors, with, with suppliers, will always lead to a far stronger outcome than uh, than, than burying your head in the sand and, and just uh, hoping that you'll muddle your way through it and, and, and work through it. I, th I think, again, that the need to have that plan in place to really understand your numbers, to be very, very clear, and cash flow is going to be the absolute uh, be all and end all for, for all small businesses in the short term, understanding those, those flows in, those flows out, and the impacts of those uh, amongst your suppliers and customers is, is critical. But then and once you have that, that, that plan and idea uh, there, make sure you are talking to, to, to people and, and negotiating and being a bit more honest about where you are at and you will find that there will be far, far better outcomes. I'd be really interested to hear people's perspectives on the government, the degrees of government intervention as a result of, you know, what's a pretty unprecedented crisis, right? We've had the employee subsidy, the depreciation on premises, um, the expensing the CapEx up to sort of 5K, um, and, and the IRD being uh, told to be a, a, a bit more lenient. Is there anything that, you know, any of you on the panel think is something that the government needs to look more at or put some more money behind potentially? I just want to say, um, interestingly, especially again for small business people, um, they rail against government and they go, we want less government involvement in business. Uh, and then, of course, when all this happened, everyone's going, where's government? So, um, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. And we're seeing this with the banks too, you know, trying really hard to put, you know, situation services, um, call centres in place to help people and people are railing against them. So there's, a, there's this kind of negative backlash that comes from people that are trying to help. Uh, we did a webinar uh, yesterday, actually, with uh, with a bank, and it was surprising. You know, there was uh, you know several hundred people in the audience, and it was rather interesting to see how many people were going. When are you going to adjust the tax? And you know, you're going bank doesn't do tax, uh, you know, so, you know, even there's a lot of confusion. And I want to pick up on Leanne's point about the the trusted advisors. She was referencing this um, and it's it's a really important concept for small business people to understand. And I, th I think most people are reticent or they're scared to go to IRD and talk to them about their tax. So they avoid it. They're scared to talk to the bank because they think they might be turned away, refused and, 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 getting someone alongside them that has doesn't have an a, a, a financial or an emotional investment in their business is useful. Um, we have, um, you know, and this is not, I'm not just plugging our service, but we have 2000 experienced people who have gifted their time to work alongside small business people as mentors. And the point with a mentor, or even if you find someone in your community, not your wife, not your friend because they're your cheerleaders and they'll go, oh, you're great, you do wonderful, but they won't say actually, you know, you need to close your business and, and, and get out of there because it's the right thing to do. So someone that can see things clearly will give you advice and, and that advice can and should include, now you need to invest money in an accountant. Now you need to invest money in a lawyer because a lawyer will do this for you. It's a professional service. It's gonna cost you this much money and this is what you should expect on the outcome. Well, can I just come back to your question about um, government support? Because I'm not going to lose the opportunity to answer that one. Um, and, and I'll be um, very short and brief. I think the government have done an, an excellent job in getting the wage subsidy into the hands of uh, employers to pass on to employees very, very quickly. Uh, and that has been the saviour for a huge amount of business. I think they need to be looking uh, right now about whether or not that needs to be extended, given we've been in lockdown for a little bit longer. Uh, and also recognising that there are businesses uh, that cannot op um, operate under Alert Level 3. We need to look at what ongoing support is available for those organisations. 
Um, there's been a lot of talk about businesses not being able to meet their overheads. The wage subsidy has been great to retain staff, which is incredibly important. So when we come out the other side, they've still got their staff, uh, but they've still got um, you know, lease obligations, rates, um, and general operating expenses. So I think uh, we've certainly been advocating through our networks um, around continuing uh, to look for support, direct financial support for the uh, small businesses in particular, and also for those um, hospitality providers and some of the retailers and obviously tourism um, who, who can't operate it and have been deeply impacted. We're fortunate in that you're a panel which all engage with business in different ways. I'm wondering if we can table some of the biggest concerns that business is ha having at the moment. And, and as a double up on that question as well, I wonder if there's anyone on the panel that thinks things are going to go back to normal. The borders are going to open up, tourism businesses will be doing tourism in New Zealand the same way they did, this kind of stuff. I'll, I'll jump in there first. Um, look, I, I, I think it would be um, incredibly optimistic thinking to think that we are going to go back into a world that looked uh, anything like it did uh, in, in January and February of this year. I, I have had a number of conversations with a number of, of business owners, uh, particularly around construction and trades that have literally down tools um, and you know, sort of going into lockdown and know that they have a fair amount of work to sort of head back into. Um, the, the question for, for those sorts of industries and those sorts of things is, you know, month two, month three, month four, uh, you know, where, where are the projects and, and things from there? We know there's a number of industries that have immediately been impacted and the flow on effect of all of that is going to mean that, you know, there, there is a, a, an inevitable contraction coming. So part of that financial modelling, that financial plan needs to be realistic um, and, and needs to be incredibly conservative. You, you have got to come to grips with what the what, what your new business model uh, looks like very quickly, um, and you need to to put some plans and things in place around uh, how you know, whether that's a diversification strategy, whether that is some sort of overhead cutting type uh, strategy or, or redeployment of, of resource. Um, there's any number of ways of of coming at that, but just to think that we're going to you know uh, yeah it's, it's a four week hiatus and we roll back into to something that looked like it did beforehand um, is, is incredibly. Um, yeah, op optimistic, as I said. If I just expand on that, um, you know, if you take an example where you're looking at, say, a mechanic, right? Uh, and yep, cars haven't been driving, so there haven't been any or accidents or the same sort of rate of accidents, but they'll they will start uh, as people start uh, to move. But uh, if you look at the global supply chain around our parts being made. Uh, for them, I guess when when you're thinking about uh, do you need to pivot and what the new normal look, looks like, uh, have a look through your supply chain to make sure that you'll be able to actually meet the obligate you know, not the obligations here, but actually meet the demand that you, you might have as well. I, I, I want to be, and I was going to I was going to ask you if, if banks are sort of in a position to sort of understand the fact that projections are going to be super hard to do at this point, right? Because nobody really knows what on earth this economy is going to look like. WEF and the IMF can't figure it out. How on earth is a SME? Yeah, <laughs> no, you're, um, you're exactly right, Will. And I, I echo Matt's thoughts and, um, and there we've got, we've got some clients of ours who are feeling pretty, I wouldn't say optimistic, but they know that the next four to six weeks they've got work coming through. And then there's that uncertainty around, well, what next and what will what from there. So I think um, I probably just go back to the fact that it's, it's, it's just the, now is the time to go and sit down with, with your accountant, with your mentor, with your professional and, and project out, you know, the next six, 12, 18, 24 months. And to, to, so you get an understanding of what, you know, business as usual, the new business as usual is going to look like. And um, doing that will help you understand perhaps what, your funding requirements might be, if you have any, um, and that'll be part of what the banks we wanted to see moving forward is what what do you, what is what do you feel like the new norm looks like for you? I'm I'm sort of interested about what business should businesses should be doing in the coming days and the mm. coming months. With the we know the lockdown's coming off on Tuesday, right? But some businesses have been let in; they've been able to kind of get the wheels in motion, I suppose. What do they need to do right now? So if they haven't already started planning for um, you know, their return on Tuesday, um, they should absolutely be doing that now. Um, so that, that's really important. Uh, you know, there are some uh, additional health and safety requirements clearly to operate safely under Alert Level 3. Uh, and then there are industry-specific guidelines as well. So um, they need to make sure that they're aware of those. Uh, they need to be really diligent about having that plan documented, um, having engaged with their uh, employees, 
and having consulted with them to make sure that they are part of helping to manage those risks, that's absolutely essential. So if they haven't done that, um, they absolutely need to. And there's some really great resources um, that are available through um, through our organisation uh, and EMA to do that. So that's the first thing. I, I think just coming back to the other question, I think it's really important that everyone does have um, in mind there is going to be an end to COVID-19. Um, and so we need to, you know, have one eye on the future. It's very, very easy to become um, reactive and just to be reacting day in, day out to the current situation. And it's really hard when you're in that situation to actually take some time out to go, actually, what does the future look like and, and how, how's that different? Because decisions that you make today may very well impact your ability to operate in the future. Yeah, Ingrid, to your point, um, the, the second day issue really is CRM, right? And, and you've brought it up before the grim reality of you might start calling people or calling suppliers and those companies may well not exist. It's probably day one, two or three. Hopefully you've actually been in communication with your suppliers and uh, your debtors uh, during this lockdown period that you've taken the time to actually reflect on your business and gotten in touch. Uh, but there is no doubt that uh, if you've had to pivot uh, your business uh, so that you can deliver contactless um, delivery on you know, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, that'll be what you'll be trying out. So not only, um, as Leanna said, do you need to uh, plan out your health and safety and how you're going to uh, ensure social distancing at Smoko. I mean, I always think quite, you know, quite pragmatically, uh, hopefully you're calling your employees this week and having a chat about how they feel. There's likely to be some people that are anxious about coming back to work because they've got potentially vulnerable people in their bubble. And, uh, and so what you might need to do then is outline what your plan is. Uh, and then uh, and that could be um, split rosters, different times. Uh, it could be that they stay at home and you're managing meetings then between people there. But I think on day one, day two, day three, uh, there's a few things that I'd add to what, what you get on with. Um, and that would be <clears throat> that uh, you brief everyone on that first day around, here's how we're going to try out the new normal, both from a health and safety and also client perspective. We're, we're selling these products, but what we want your feedback on is what demand is like. What are the clients telling us that can help you get a trigger for should you order more or not? What I um, think is going to be, uh, people are going to predict that there's going to be a little latent demand. And then let's say they get quite excited about what happens in the first uh, few days uh, and weeks. And then they over order and over provision because that actually then dies away. And so we don't want to have that happen. So I guess that my view is that you want to have some flexible feedback mechanisms. So you, in, in the morning, you're having the briefing with your, uh, your team. And at the end of the first day, I would recommend having a review around two things, your safety, how did that go? Did we actually respect the social distance at Smoko? Um, did, uh, was anyone, any concerns there? But also, what did we learn about our customers from the day that we just had that will inform what we do tomorrow as we think about uh, how we tune our business uh, for the weeks ahead? Hey, Leanne, I'm really keen to hear from you about the debt hibernation and the safe harbour legislation at all. Uh, if you think that's of value, if you think it's sort of kicking the can down the road a bit? Um, look, I think it will be of value, but, but not to everyone. And that's like a lot of the support. Um, you know, there are different situations um, for different size businesses, for different sectors, and for, you know, for different uh, stages of a business, I guess. So I, I think, you know, all of the um, interventions that have been put forward will provide some assistance um, for business. There's no doubt about that, but they won't be one size fits all in general. Uh, I mean, other than things like the wage subsidy, for, for example, that's, you know, that, that generally is sort of the one size fits all. Um, so, yeah, look, I think, I think it will be of value um, and it will provide some uh, added um, support for business, but not for, not for all business. Speaking of good advice, team, I'm, I'm mindful that you all kind of need to get out of here, but I really want a final lightning round. Perhaps you can give us the best single bit of advice for an SME, given they're all getting back to work today when this show is um, ideas, how we all kind of need it at this point. Anyone want to go first? Well, I'll, I'll kick off. I think the, the biggest thing is just um, communication is key. Get in touch with uh, with with those your stakeholders get in touch early um, and and understand the options that you that you have and that you can provide um, to those. Yep, I, I would say uh, put put your hand up and, and and don't be afraid to talk. It's uh, it, it's tough out there. The world of small business has always been an incredibly challenging place. Uh, it, it's a uh, it's always said how it's the backbone of the economy in New Zealand, and it, and it absolutely is. We need uh, all of those fantastic uh, SME business owners to continue 
doing what they're doing um, and, and really uh, propping up all of our regions in our country, but it is a tough place and, and you're not out there on your own. There is um, a, a, a huge range of support. The, the key thing for small business people in particular is plan. Um, you know, most of them don't, um, and it's always been a problem with small business, is the lack of planning. But to start somewhere, don't make it complicated. Um, but keep in mind, um, as an officer of an organisation, if you're the director, you have a due diligence duty, not only to those around you, uh, your staff, but to others, so people that um, you impact, um, and yourself. So you, you have to put on paper how what you see the risks are associated to your business and identify how you're going to mitigate it. And it's not, and that's not just so you've got things sorted. It's so you can show evidence if things go wrong, that um, you did everything in your power. And um, so, so even though everyone's playing nice at the moment, uh, if things start going wrong, um, there are departments, government departments and others that may not look kindly on you if you extend our lockdown or um, put other people out of business as a result of your negligence. Um, look, I think um, really good points that everyone's made. I would absolutely encourage people to also not uh, lose sight of uh, often there is opportunities that come out of adversity. Um, if, don't, don't let's forget about all the new uh, you know, uses of technology, the collaboration, how creative and innovative we have been during lockdown, take those things with you on the way forward rather than going back to the old ways because often you'll be more productive uh, and you may just find that the new business model that you've had to pivot into uh, is actually a far better model than the one that you left behind. Yeah, I want to piggyback on your um, one, if I can there, Leanne, because I always uh, try and talk from the side of technology, as Ingrid will say. Um, it's so easy to get involved in e-commerce and to spin up sort of cloud services and stuff like that for your business, whether it be an online store with Shopify or, or, or WooCommerce or any of that stuff, you don't need to think the way you did maybe in the mid 2000s, which is you've got to pay the IT guy to spin up this massive server for you and all this kind of stuff. It's all in the cloud and, and given the social distancing rules that haven't seemed to go away with, with level three, you're going to have to at least give it a go if you can, if, if you're the sparky or the plumber or something, maybe a little bit different. But if, if only it makes your business a little bit more efficient, if only it means that you've got a couple, you know, less customer service people being more efficient. I think that's the one for me. Ingrid, what have you got? You know, just listening to um, you all, I got uh, incredibly present to the people that do run our businesses and the experience that they are going through. Um, I mean, this is the end of 15 episodes uh, for you. And if you've got to the end of this one, um, you know, what I really wanted to say, and particularly we've just gone through Anzac Day, um, is that, you know, celebrating Anzac Day, it is the sort of sense that we can get through these things. Um, there are moments they pass, they are challenges. This is an, another one. It's um, incredibly personal, the business that you run uh, for you. And, um, you know, I think if I think about all the relationships that are being tested, not only because of lockdown, uh, but, the, but the financial pressures that they're under, uh, you know, these are challenging. Uh, reach out and get whatever advice you, you, you can. We will innovate our way through this as a country. We always do. We are um, phenomenal people. Uh, the worst thing that could happen is if it goes under and you take that personally and you take um, some drastic action. And what we want more than anything is um, for you to survive, for you to come out, learn the lessons um, and to make a massive difference for us because we all know that people don't get it right first time necessarily and that from those learnings, they come back better and brighter, uh, smarter and more often. And, it, you know, you might confront some very uncomfortable times, but get, uh, be honest, um, it's people before business, I think, at the moment in, in a little ways, but I know that the business realities are what are going to pull people down. Uh, but ultimately, it's your ambition, the things that you've learnt that are going to help us go through as a country, and we want you all to be here as we go through that. Um, it's been a pleasure, uh, more than anything, to um, provide this uh, uh, series uh, for you guys, and, you know, all the best uh, as you navigate your way. And... Um, I think there are so many people here to support you. Just lean on them. That Everyone that we've had come speak to you. Uh, if you reached out to them, they'd absolutely tell you where to go and what you could do and what could make a difference um, for you. And, uh, look, I just hope you all the best as you uh, navigate your way through this kind of cash flow and COVID crisis. And uh, I want to see you come back and, and flourish more. 
an awesome way to leave it, Ingrid, because, yeah, it's, it's, it must be a horrendous experience for so many people out there. And this has been such a cool vehicle that I've really enjoyed um, at least getting information out there and um, empowering people to at least have the knowledge. And the information that came from Matt Rogers, the accountant and chairman of NZCA, Beth uh, Benloff, Hagen, the senior business banker at ANZ, Craig Garner, chief executive of Business Mentors New Zealand, and Leanne Watson, the chief executive of Canterbury Chamber of Commerce has been massively uh, valuable. So team, thank you all so much for joining us on our final show. And before we go to you at home, remember we've covered so much that we just talked about. So be sure to check out the back cabinet blog. Uh, we were talking you through so many of the issues we spoke about today and many more. For so many of us, it will be that first day back at the coalface. So best of luck with that. All the day's business news continues at nzherald.co.nz. Um, and Ingrid, we owe a big thank you to the accounting and payroll rock stars at MYOB for making the series possible. Thank you so much, MYOB. I use it. And if you, you know, if you're running an SME uh, at home, you should check it out and see if it might work for you as well. Until next time, SMEs, kia kaha, bye for now.